My name is Ian Knowles. I'm a technical officer with the Air Navigation Bureau. I work in the operational safety section and my responsibility is flight operations and performance-based navigation. Performance-based navigation really is um, a method of navigation that sprung out of a need to get more capacity into the system. So originally we used to navigate by uh, flying directly towards or directly away from ground-based radio aids, um, which is fine, it works very well, but unfortunately it's a little bit limited because the routes that we can build have to be directly from those ground-based radio aids to, uh, in a straight line. So performance-based navigation came out of the original concept of aero navigation, which is where we can use the capabilities of the aircraft to define waypoints, which aren't physical locations, they're just uh, points in space, and we can fly between those waypoints rather than flying between the ground-based radio aids. So really, uh, aero navigation allows us then to generate routes and procedures which can be fitted into the airspace where they're required rather than around the radio aids which we have on the ground. That means we have a lot more flexibility to build routes where we want them and where we need them, and it means we can open up much more capacity in the airspace system. So the original implementations of area navigation really were about using the capability of the aircraft to, uh, to exploit this phenomena and fly to waypoints, and performance-based navigation is, is kind of the evolution of that. So we move away from mandating the carriage of specific pieces of equipment to fly, and we start talking about what the capabilities, the performance requirements are of the aircraft to be able to operate in that environment. Uh, so we define the performance in terms of not just navigation accuracy, which is the one that most people are aware of, but obviously uh, also integrity, continuity, and functionality. Uh, the whole uh, idea of aero navigation started with the capabilities of the aircraft. So it was a functionality that was built into the airplane systems that we could use. We could define these waypoints, these points in space, and navigate between them. Um, however, it, it became clear once people started to implement it that in fact, the real driver was the performance of the system rather than the capability. And so work began to look at actually defining what those performance requirements were and developing a set of what we call navigation specifications, which had those specific performance requirements associated with them. Now, ICAO was involved from quite an early stage. Back in the 90s, this work started uh, with what used to be called originally the RNP capability uh, and then became just required navigation performance. And there was a couple of expert groups that were set up by, by the council to look at um, harmonizing what was happening in the world in terms of exploiting this area navigation capability. What happened was that, that um, everyone started to see the benefits of area navigation. They started to develop their own uh, implementations of it. And unfortunately, those weren't always aligned. So one of the things that ICAO does very well is, is align and, and provide standardization for various, uh, various issues. And so really the PBN concept grew out of that evolution of air and navigation, the different implementations that the states were using. And the PBN concept was developed, which had those standardized navigation specifications, which were then laid out in, in the PBN manual, what was originally the RNP manual, now the PBN manual, uh, which became the, the defining standard for performance-based navigation. So that's really ICAO's involvement up to the creation of the PBN concept. Uh, what we're facing now is, is a number of issues, one of which is, is pretty key, and that's training. Now, training is really a key problem in a lot of areas. Uh, and really, the, the issue with performance-based navigation is making sure that all the stakeholders really have a good understanding of what the PBN concept is and how it applies. One of the key problems that we see in PBN often is that people think it's all about what the airplane can do. Now, it's true that the aircraft have to be qualified to do performance-based navigation. And in fact, in the flight manuals, you'll see a list of what the aircraft capabilities are. Problem is that people read that and they think, ah, this aircraft is good for RMP1, that means I can do RMP1, and that's unfortunately not the case. So there's a whole bunch of other stuff that has to be done. There's uh, training for the flight crews and for air traffic controllers. There's standard procedures that have to be developed. There's contingency procedures. There's oversight from the regulator. All of these things have to be in place in order to make PBN actually work effectively. And so one of the uh, workshops we've been running at ICAO recently is the PBN Ops Approval Workshop. And we try and make that point quite strongly in the Ops Approval Workshop that it's not just about what the airplane can do. You, yes, you need an airplane that's capable of PBN but you also need to have an operator that understands PBN and understands how to set up that training program, 
how to put in those procedures, how to have everything in place, how to make sure that the crew will follow the procedures, etc. So, so it's quite a big uh, area that, uh, that is needed to be covered. The Ops Approval Workshop has been doing that really well. Uh, one of the issues we found in the Ops Approval Workshop, however, is that we're still seeing people come in with a little bit of a lack of basic understanding of what some of the PBN concepts are. And so now we're looking at developing a more, uh, a more basic introduction to PBN, which will work as a, as a kind of precursor to that workshop. So we'll get people to do PBN fundamentals first. They can go away, they can really learn the basics, get a solid understanding of what PBN is, and then they can come and do the PBN Ops Approval Workshop and go through how to make sure the operators are correctly applying all the PBN requirements and that everything is set up to work properly. So, so training is a really key issue. Um, another issue that we're seeing a little bit is, is what we call PBN for the sake of PBN. Um, and so it's, you know, it's been a kind of buzzword for a while. Now people are aware that PBN is, is a good thing to have. Uh, and unfortunately what that sometimes means is that they go out and, and get some PBN in order to meet a target somewhere. Um, and really what we're trying to um, advertise and what we're trying to promote is that PBN is a great tool for solving problems. If you have capacity problems or you have airspace issues or you have uh, an aerodrome that you want to increase uh, access for, for aircraft to the aerodrome in different weather conditions, then yes, PBN can be a really great benefit to you. But it's not something you do just for the sake of doing it. it it's a means to an end. And so we do sometimes see PBN for the sake of PBN where routes and procedures are developed and they're put in place, but there's not really any overall plan of how it's supposed to fit with the rest of the airspace. And unfortunately, that sometimes means that the procedures never really get used. And so the, the box has been ticked and they say, yes, we have a PBN approach, but actually it's not really effective. It's not really a good implementation of PBN. Uh, that can be a problem as well sometimes. So another issue that we've got, and, and it's a little bit linked to, to training understanding, is that when we had the, the original PBN concept, we built it up from what originated before the air navigation concept. And some of those existing terminology and, and, and phraseology came in with the air navigation concept. So we didn't really start from scratch. We ended up um, having kind of legacy terms that were used a little bit in PBN. And, and the RNAV approach is, is a good example of that. So right now in the PBN concept, in the PBN manual, the only type of approach that we have is an RNP approach, but for historical reasons, they've been called RNAV approaches. Now, we make quite a big deal in the manual about the difference between RNAV and RNP, and then we have an RNP approach nav spec, and we refer to it as RNAV. And that's quite confusing, as you can probably imagine. So what we're trying to get to is, is a more harmonized state where you know, if we're talking about something which is RNP, then we call it RNP. If it's RNAV, we call it RNAV. And so the approach naming is, is an area that we're working on to try and get that harmonization. Uh, we have a lot of procedures published today which are published as RNAV, and they should be published as RMP, and we're encouraging states to change those and make everything consistent. So actually when people read the manual or they're, or they're educated about PBN, it all makes sense because the terminology is correct and it matches what they're expecting. So there are a few issues still to, uh, to resolve, but hopefully we're getting there. I suppose Aerodrome Operating Minimum, PBAOM, it's kind of a new thing that we're working on in, in the ops area right now. Um, and really what PBAOM is, it's, it's about defining the operating minima based on not just the infrastructure on the ground, but also the capabilities of the aircraft. Now, the typical example that people tend to see is about using uh, something like an enhanced vision system um, on an airplane, so what we call an advanced aircraft to get a better minima for landing. So let's say, for example, you're flying an ILS and you need to be visual with the ground at 200 feet above, uh, above the ground. And at 200 feet, you can't see anything because you're entering into either clouds or fog. But with your enhanced vision system, it allows you to see using the EVS, the terrain and the runway environment. Well, in that situation, you can continue to land uh, and therefore you're getting an in, what we call an enhanced minima or lower minima. So it improves access to the aerodrome. And it's that combination of the aircraft ability and the ground facilities that gives you that better minima. Now, that's the kind of well-known example. What we're really interested in, what we're excited in, is when you start to look at PBAOM combined with PBN. So a PBN approach, an RNP approach, is something that can be put onto a runway, or, or indeed we're seeing examples where PBN approaches can be developed to patches of ground that aren't even runways. Uh, there's a very famous example up in Scotland, in the UK, which is 
uh, a PBN approach to a beach that's used by commercial aircraft. Um, and those PBN approaches can be put into places where there really is no ground infrastructure at all. And so you're relying completely on the airplane and you can then enhance the airplane again with the EVS systems and other, and other improvements and get some really quite good minima um, on, uh, on an aerodrome or in an area where there really is no ground infrastructure. Well, why is that important? Well, there's a number of issues where it could be important for a start. Uh, putting in something like a, even just a Cat 1 ILS is quite a costly and expensive business. So you've got a lot of ground infrastructure to put in place to maintain and to keep, um, keep up to date and to keep doing validation testing flights. Now, if you can start getting approaches which approach the, uh, the same kind of minima as an ILS Cat 1, but really don't rely on that kind of initial upfront investment, you're starting to open up those aerodromes or those landing sites to more um, frequent uh, arrivals, to better consistent arrivals without having that huge investment up front. So we're seeing it really as a, as a key driver of the No Country Left Behind initiative. And we're saying, you know, this is an alternative route. You've got, on the one hand, you've got the traditional route. You pay a lot of money up front. You get a Cat 1 ILS. It's great. Here's another route you can look at where there's no ground infrastructure. There's nothing to put in place. There's nothing to maintain. It's, it's a procedure that has to be designed. And then you're relying on the aircraft capability rather than the ground infrastructure itself. So it's a really interesting kind of concept that we think goes quite well with PBN. And, and hopefully is, is quite exciting for, for new developments coming up. So, so right now we have an expert group in ICAO which is called the PBN Study Group. And the PBNSG is responsible really for the up, ongoing uh, maintenance of the PBN concept. So they're the, the guardians, the owners of the PBN manual. For the last couple of years, we've been working on developing the fifth edition of the PBN manual. Uh, and that's got some quite significant changes in. So, uh, in terms of the, the big, big ticket items, really, we're introducing uh, a new nav spec or a new sub nav spec, I guess. So we have uh, something called RMP AR, which is RMP authorization required. It's one of the more uh, exacting navigation specifications. It's designed for use in challenging terrain with obstacles and, and uh, specific airspace requirements. And we've had RMP AR approaches for some time. And with the fifth edition of the manual, we'll be introducing RMP AR departures. So that's a it's a brand new uh, nav spec introduction. We're also making some changes to the advanced RNP nav spec. Now, that was introduced in the fourth edition in 2013, but we haven't really seen much take up of advanced RNP in the world. And part of the reason uh, we think is that there's been some complexities in implementing, implementing that, um, that nav spec. And we're trying to resolve that a little bit by, by ironing out some of those issues in the new version of the advanced RMP nav spec. So for example, we used to have an option for uh, RMP scalability, which meant you could pick any, any value uh, between 0 0.3 and 1 nautical mile outside the final approach. And we're taking that out and we're just saying, no, it's going to be a fixed value of 0 0.3 now, uh, which makes it a little simpler. Uh, we've also excluded the final approach itself from the nav spec. And that's really because we're seeing a lot more introduction now of what we call PBN to XLS, which is a performance-based navigation route that terminates in either an ILS or an MLS or a GLS final approach. And it gets a little bit confusing if, you, if you're starting to build those routes using advanced RNP, which contains a final approach, which is PBN, but then you're laying on top of that an ILS or an MLS. You, you're kind of double counting the final approach segment. So we're taking out the final approach segment from advanced RNP and making a few other changes. Um, and along with the RNP AR departures, those are the kind of big changes. We're also using the fifth edition as a good opportunity to clarify some of the issues that we've been seeing over the last few years. So edition four came out in 2013. There's been a lot of lessons learned over the last six years. And we're really trying to put those, um, you know, that knowledge and experience into the fifth edition PBN manual. So we're clarifying issues such as there's a, an ongoing problem of understanding where, where people think RNAV1 has to be used in a in a radar environment, an RNP1 is, is designed for use in a non-radar environment, and that's not the case. It's actually, it's, it, you know, whichever nav spec is most appropriate is the one that can be used, so that's being clarified. Uh, we're clarifying things such as the use of RF legs, so radius to fix. Uh, these are very good um, PBN leg types. They give you a consistent, repeatable path over the ground. 
Um, and because they're new and because they're very good in the, in the situations they're used in, there's a tendency to want to use them all the time. And really, we're starting to put some guidance in to say, yeah, they, you know, these are, these are great solutions. Don't get me wrong. They, they're great tools to use. But they should be used appropriately in places where they're going to have maximum benefit. Uh, we have some other issues in there, some, some um, explanation of what VNAV is. So we get uh, ongoing issues with VNAV uh, in the final approach, whether it's what we call VNAV for credit or advisory VNAV. And we've tried to explain that a little bit in the, in the new version of the manual that's coming out too. So it's a really good update to a, a lot of the items within the manual. It's good clarification. It's lessons learned. And there's a couple of new items in there, the RMPR, NASPEC, and Advanced RMP. So that's uh, good stuff. Uh, the final draft of that has been done by the PBN study group. It's currently out with the rest of the ICAO panels for review and comment. And we're hoping to get it published end of 2020 or early 2021.